Good afternoon. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you to the third event in our 2022 lecture series, a lecture, Road to Republic, exploring 400 years of a political experiment. My name is Justin Robinson, and I'm your chairperson for today. I have planned to position myself to show the audience my wonderful mountain view from St. Vincent, but with all the rain, I am stashed in a corner. And our speaker for today needs no introduction. Uh, an old friend, contemporary of mine, Peter Wickham, who I think needs no introduction. So Peter, I'm giving you a special welcome on behalf of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, and we appreciate you taking the time to come and be part of our annual lecture series. I want to welcome the audience and really express our appreciation for your support and your continued support of this activity. If you are on Zoom, you can put your questions in the Q&A. Or if you're joining us on Facebook, you put your questions in the comment section and questions will be answered after the opening statements. The 2022 lecture series is hosted by the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, the University of the West Indies is Department of History and Philosophy and the Embassy of Argentina to Barbados. And we at the museum are eternally grateful to the continued support and sponsorship from the Department of History and Philosophy at UWI and the Embassy of Argentina to Barbados. Now, Peter is the main event today. So after that introduction, I'm, I'm gonna turn it over. Peter, it's all yours. Okay. Um, thanks, Professor. I am happy to be in your distinguished company. And I also want to thank the members of the Barbados Museum and Historic Society for the invitation. Um, I have never had the opportunity to, to be in a conversation with members of this society before, and, and I'm happy to take the opportunity to bring uh, a bit of my perspective in terms of politics to this forum, which tends to be a lot more historic. So um, there is a political history as well that needs to be told, and I really want to thank you guys for doing it. Also, thank you, Justin, for the warm uh, invitation, the warm welcome that you have uh, presented and given us. So I, I will start and tell you what I propose to do today. Um, I want to look at a history of electoral, elective politics, but I'm more inclined to the history of the electoral politics and, and more specifically participation and, and to a less extent political parties uh, in terms of Barbados's development up until this point. Um, I was asked initially about dealing with trade unions and trade union movements and so on as part of that exercise. You would of course appreciate that our political party history is also to some extent linked to a trade union movement. Uh, the Barbados Labour Party, the oldest political party, also has a close relationship and evolution from the Barbados Workers Union. So there was a departure point, but I do feel that that is something which is a story that is often told by historians, so, uh, people like Bobby Morris point. and so on, but I do who are probably that better that at telling that story than, than I am. So I, I leave it to them to speak to that part of it, and I will look more specifically at the participation side of it and some numbers and so on. Um, there's an important uh, historic date in, in all of our conversation, which is 19, uh, 30th December 1951, which was the time of universal adult suffrage. And it is important to anchor the conversation in this whole uh, 1951 universal adult suffrage movement. The reason it is significant because it is from that point onward that we can talk about inclusive politics. Uh, before that, if you wanted to vote in Barbados, you had to be uh, either a man, and, and there was a time when it was only men, and then women were brought in later. And then there was a time when you had to actually own property in order to be uh, a voter. Of course, there was a time where you had to be white as well, but we, we, we moved past that. From 1951, basically what government said is that once you achieve an age, which was 21 at that time, you can vote regardless of what you have and so on. In a sense, this is a critical point because it lays the basis for mass-based politics. It's not about a politics that speaks to business people who own property and says to them, let me organize 
and coalesce around your concerns and your needs. It's about a situation where a mass-based political party can say, well, let me set up a constituency branch. Let me go into the Huskins in St. Joseph, or let me go into the Huskins in St. John. So I'm gonna go into Pool St. John, I'm gonna organize a branch, I'm gonna find out what are the issues on the ground, and I'm gonna get people to agitate towards getting a representative that can speak to them. The alternative that we would have had before 1951 is a situation where, because of the, the absence of universal adult suffrage, you could have a, a planter that would be elected to parliament to agitate on behalf of planters and to answer their concerns because those were money concerns. The logic, of course, is really very simple. The logic said that if you own property, then you had a stake and you had an interest. Um, essentially, you're mitigating against the, the possibility that someone who may not own anything may have an interest in the state or the assumptions that the only way you can have an interest in the state is if you actually own something. Uh, or alternatively, you were literate because there was a time when it was also a literacy consideration. Um, I have to admit that sometimes when you hear the kinds of issues and stuff that people talk about, one wonders whether there's not a basis for introducing that because the reality is that anyone can vote. But I also argue that this is something which um, we have to live with. We, we have to understand that every voter is a voter that is worthy of a vote and every voter has to be given consideration for. So the idea of a mass-based political party and mass-based politics is firmly anchored in the 1951 universal adult suffrage. And as I said, that's where the conversation starts because that's when you can start building mass. Um, mass-based political parties, you know, they go way back in you know, the United Kingdom, they would have had them um, in socialist republics. They also have the mass-based political parties. And the idea is that your, your leadership is organized around uh, a, a base, which is fundamentally a people at the level of a branch. They would elect a representative and that representative would go forward to the central place and, and represent their interests. And they are anchored to that because they have to report back to their, their um, branches in order to get their support. Of course, it doesn't work that way in reality because the Caribbean islands are very small and, and the parties have become very much leader-centered, but that is the way it should work in theory. Um, the 1956 political parties, uh, and we moved from 51 to 56, uh, were the Barbados Labour Party, which is still in existence, the Democratic Labour Party. We had the Progressive Conservative Party, and we have the People's Progressive Movement. Um, among these, you're familiar with the B and the D. Of course, they have a similar origin, uh, and they're both mass-based political parties fundamentally representing workers. They're both labor parties. The PCP was a slightly different uh, conversation. It was essentially the conservatives, um, the slightly more business-inclined parties that would say that they're looking out for that level of interest. Um, the People's Progressive Movement, I, I'm not terribly familiar with what their agenda was. Uh, I think that it was more a people's party. So it would have been trying to mimic or to achieve what the BLP and DLP would otherwise have done. Um, I prepared a, a sheet for you, which is critical to our conversation. And uh, I want to share it with you at this point in time. Um, I have to apologize for my awkwardness in terms of the Zoom's sharing facility. Uh, find it. And again, I apologize in trying to identify where this document is. There we are, found it. Okay, so this is uh, a chart that I prepared for you, which looks at electoral participation essentially from 1951 all the way over to 2022. Uh, and I'm gonna comment a lot on it over time, um, but just generally speaking, you can note that in 1951, we went in with 62,000 voters. Uh, in 2022, we took 248,000 voters. Um, this is the uh, 
essentially the evolution of our part, party, our participatory base in Barbados. Uh, I'm going to make a couple of observations on these numbers over time, but uh, essentially you're looking at a situation where the, there's been a steady increase in the numbers of persons who are eligible to participate. Um, critical point would be 1964, when we moved the voting age from uh, 21 to 18, which it currently stands at. And in 1964, um, that would have been an opportunity for the party support, part, party base to increase, uh, for the political, the participatory base to increase. The irony is that in 1961, you had 104,518 people, and in 1966, you had 99,988. Um, my sense is that there was some rationalization, which reflected in the fact that the voters list was probably more clean which is also the basis of another point that I wanted to make uh, about later. So if you look at the years that we have actually had a decrease in the number of voters, it's not necessarily reflective of a decrease in the number of people who are eligible to participate, but it's essentially just a decrease that you're noticing based on the fact that we have an administrative change or something that is done that is uh, essentially making it possible to kind of clean up the list and do so more effectively. So in 1966, you're seeing um, a drop of 4.3%. Uh, and this is a real registration increase, not necessarily just a shift or change. This is a real increase, uh, decrease in registration, 4% uh, decrease. And then we saw in 1991, there was a 1% decrease uh, where that was also reflected. In 1999, um, there was a 1994 effort to clean up the electoral list. We had a complete re-registration. And out of that, we lost 1% um, of our voting base. Essentially, this is telling us that our voting base increases probably more rapidly than it should, or the number of voters appears to increase more rapidly than it should, largely because um, people are, we're not managing the list as well as we could. And when coming on to the end of the conversation, I can give you some ideas in terms of my own sense of how we can, can deal with those things. But we've been essentially not managing the list as well as we could. Uh, and sadly, um, we have been seeing these exponential growths and increases when the, the fact is that a number of those persons are not eligible to vote anyhow. So um, if a person in Barbados dies, um, and we, we know that the person is dead because it's a death certificate that's issued, or everyone knows that they're dead because they heard it on the radio, um, it, it is not enough to remove that person from the list. It still has to be an advertisement of that person's name. Uh, and in many instances, the Electoral Bond Use Commission has to have the resources to publish the advertisement because it has to be published in the paper. So it's expensive. Technically speaking, it should not be necessary because government pays people pensions and the person's day, you make a call to the elector, to the, to the um, National Insurance Office, and you say, look, remember my mother has died or my father has died. Um, either we have or we don't have a death certificate, but we are, are pretty confident that the person is dead because they're not breathing. Um, and that person can be removed. So government no longer pays them a pension. It should perhaps be as easy as that to take a person off the electoral list, but unfortunately it is not because you have to give them the opportunity to object. Um, and the fact that they're dead makes it very difficult for them to object. So ultimately, whenever the names are published, they will come off. But the challenge is that it takes a while to get to that stage. If that person goes overseas and dies, as often happens, it, it makes it even worse. Sometimes people migrate, they have no further interest in participating in elections in Barbados, but they're still eligible. The names remain on the list, even though that cannot be considered an active voter. So my, uh, my, my nanny that, that raised me, um, left Barbados back in the 70s and went to, to the United States of America to live, as did so many others. Um, she remained there until she died, uh, and I suspect that her name is still on the voting list simply because uh, she would have been registered as a voter. These are the kinds of peculiarities that have resulted in us needing to take changes to reduce from time to time. And as I said, we have 1966, 1999 being two periods where that happened, and the voters list uh, would have contracted somewhat. Um, the actual voter turnout is another matter, and that's also presented in the, the document that I have prepared, uh, and that essentially runs um, from 65% uh, in 1951 to the, the all-time low of 46% in 2022. Um, perhaps I can say a bit more about voter turnout, but I didn't think it was so much of a voter turnout 
talk that we were having today, it was more about registration and numbers of registration and people participating and so on. So I'll stop sharing this for now and um, continue with the conversation and then maybe we can go back to it later and, and see. Um, I wanted to, to make a point that we had uh, universal adult suffrage, as I said, uh, from 2021 in 1951 and then 18, 1964, I made that point already. Um, the other thing is about the political parties. Um, we have had a party evolution while maintaining a two-party conversation. And it's interesting that in Barbados that both parties are socialist parties, uh, both parties are labor parties. And the, the question always comes up, what is the difference between the two political parties? And as I said, since we've maintained these since universal adult suffrage to know, the question is, you know, is it really relevant to have one versus the other? Um, my sense is that the personalities are, are what makes it different, uh, and there's a different type of personality in one party. Certainly, one party is done consistently better than the other one electorally, which, which is interesting. Um, and then maybe it's about leadership. Some people uh, like the style of leadership that one of the parties has produced, while some people prefer the style of leadership that the other party has produced. There's also a conversation for or about persons associating themselves with a political party that believes can give them more political opportunities. So um, should I be knocking on the BLP's door? No, as opposed to knocking on the DLP's door, because the DLP appears to have opportunities for me to, that the Barbados Labour Party won't have. Um, there is a suggestion, for example, that Eric Barrow decide to hedge it, decided to hedge his bets when he set up the Democratic Labour Party by saying, I will go in that direction, simply because I am I'm convinced that if I wait, for Sir Grantley to give up uh, is probably not gonna happen in a hurry. And there's an opportunity for me to go in the direction, uh, pursue independence, uh, distinguish myself, and ultimately uh, I can also become a leader. So that was a, an interesting development back in those days, which he was able to pursue. And I do feel that a lot of our politics is about this personal um, pursuit of a personal opportunity in some instances. The, the, the most successful post-independence party that we've ever had in Barbados would have been the uh, National Democratic Party under Dr. Richie Haynes. And that party was essentially personality driven. It was the personality of Dr. Haynes. Indeed, it was the money of Dr. Haynes that was, was, it was based on. Um, he was pursuing a slightly more economically liberal agenda, but at the same time, that was not what it was about initially. It was initially about Dr. Haynes and the fact that he was being pushed out of the Democratic Labour Party and it appeared to give him opportunities and so on. In there, we've had some interesting political parties like the Workers' Party of Barbados. Um, that was George Bell's party, which lasted, I think it had one electoral outing. It ran a candidate that was not Dr. Bell. And um, I think it was Ricky, um, Ricky, no, I think the guy's name is Ricky, I don't remember his last name. But he was the one candidate that ran for the Workers' Party of Barbados. And why I call it interesting is because the Workers' Party had a very clear philosophical statement that supported um, a communist orientation, um, considerably more left-wing than either the Barbados Labour Party or the Democratic Labour Party. And it was kind of akin to the, um, the Communist Party of, of Jamaica, which was the WPJ. And similarly, it offered that as an alternative option. So I'm saying philosophically, we've had those kinds of alternative options and you see what happened. Uh, the Workers' Party of Barbados lasted for one, had one electoral outing and we never heard about it again. Um, there are reasons why political parties tend not to last, but I was just giving you as an example of a party that didn't appear, that appeared to have a considerably different political philosophy and didn't go anywhere. We also had the PET, which was kind of similar to the Workers' Party of Barbados, maybe less communist, more socialist. Um, again, the personality of David Comichon, but, but more importantly, the PET was, was, was an effort to bring a lot of the, the Pan-African, pro-African, um, pro-Latin American thought on board and see if you could harness it in the context of a political party. That too um, didn't really uh, work uh, in, in any way. If we look at the chart, when I, I had it up, I was talking about the increased size of the electorate and the, the challenges it presents in terms of mapping the electoral registration. And I was making the point to you earlier that the difficulty in terms of actually understanding how the electorate is growing is being able to manage this exercise of 
recording who is a voter, recording when that person ceases to be a voter uh, and should be taken off the list. Um, so births and deaths are easy, um, you know, relatively so. But then you also have marriages that create eligibility. You have immigration that creates eligibility. Uh, and then you also have um, either a deteriorating mental, deteriorating mental capacity that creates ineligibility. Uh, and that's something that you might also want to take into consideration. These things are notoriously difficult to, to record a map, as I said, and, and part of the challenge that we have in terms of understanding how many voters are available to political parties is that we have not done a terribly good job of being able to do it. Again, when we get to the uh, reform ideas, I'll give you some ideas on what I think we ought to be doing to be able to record accurately the number of people that are available to vote. But I would tell you generally that in Barbados today, we, we do not have a clear, uh, sorry, probably close to 10% more of people who are on the voters list are, are not really available to political parties to vote. So we may think that there's a low voter turnout, but for all intents and purposes, the, the actual numbers of people voting is closer to the actual numbers of people available to vote than we might think. And that's something that we have to take into consideration. One of the reasons that I always stick to increases in terms of understanding voter participation I stick to increases because I think that increases probably give me the best opportunity to see how um, the, the conversation is going over time. So for example, um, we had an increase in registration in 1986, sorry, a decrease in 1966 and a decrease in 1999. We also had a decrease in registration in 2022. Those three decreases were probably related to administrative movements. But the reason that I can say that we, we have had those decreases is not because we're looking at the absolute number, but you're comparing it to the previous election. <coughs> Excuse me. So in the same way that we would look at the voter turnout in one election, the, the better comparative base is what it was previously and what it is now as opposed to looking at the absolute. And, and I think that that is a, a device that I have more or less come up with um, because once you have an increase in voters, 30 new voters have come on, but which doesn't mean that there's some old ones there that are ineligible to vote anyhow. Uh, and that's the reason that you've seen it. Um, on the other side, and, and I could perhaps put the, um, let me share the chart again for you. Yeah, on the other side of the conversation is the increases, because I talked about the decreases and I talked about decreases in 2020, decreases in 1999, decreases in 1966. The increases were also interesting. Uh, one of the most dramatic would have been 1961. Um, Barbados would have been going through an evolution in 1961 in terms of setting up the public service and whatnot as we prepared for independence. And while you had uh, universal adult suffrage in 51, and also 56, uh, perhaps by 1961, the, the idea of voting being promoted to political parties was something that was of interest. Um, in 1971, there was an increase of 15%. 1971 was also a year that Barbados did uh, rationalization in terms of electoral uh, rationalization. In 1971, we moved to single member constituencies. And we had a situation before in 1966 and 1961 where you had two people running for representation in the constituency. So you had a buddy system. Uh, you could vote either twice for one person, which is called plumping, or you could vote one for one person or two, 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 two representatives in a, in a political party. So you basically had two votes and you could do it that way. Uh, mercifully, we moved towards a single member system in 1971. Uh, and there were other changes, and as I said, we're seeing a result of an increase in terms of uh, voter, well, the number of voters available in 1971, that was quite significant. 76, uh, an increase of 16%, 1981, an increase of 24%, and there were all massive increases uh, in my sense that you're seeing uh, increases in, in registration. The years between 86 and 94, um, the result, the increases were relatively more uh, 
consistent, 5%, 8%, 8%. Uh, that's the kind of thing that you would see in a normal year. And then if you look at 2002 and 2008, um, again, those are the kinds of increases that you will see, see over time. Um, the 2022 decrease, my, my feeling is that by then we had already started working on our electoral system and there was a cleaning of the list that took place and a lot of advertisements. So it's possible that a lot of those were the dead voters that came off uh, and that was why there was that level of rationalization. So that is the, the other side of the conversation in terms of the um, voter participation or voter numbers actually decreasing and not decreasing. Uh, the movement from double to single member constituencies was one of the more peculiar developments that we've seen in our electoral history. Um, my assumption is that the idea of double member constituencies was the argument that gave political parties the opportunity to have more persons in parliament. One of the challenges of having a small space like Barbados where we have um, 30, 30 members uh, or even a place like St. Kitts and Nevis where you have only eight, uh, compared to the United Kingdom where you have you know, 600 members of parliament, it, it means that there's an opportunity for critical mass within parliament. And one of the ways that you can achieve critical mass is by having twice as many representatives. So you would have um, double uh, the number of people. So for every constituency, you would have two. Uh, that means you also have to give persons two votes. Now, the, the argument can be put that if everyone has two votes and there's no, not, not, um, it's not no advantage one way or the other. Um, or alternatively, you can argue that, you know, you should have one vote and, and you vote for one representative. I, I find the conversation and the relationship between a single representative is better. And I do feel that there are ideas where we can increase the number of persons that are part of the conversation in terms of the electoral uh, system. And perhaps we can do that uh, in another way. And again, I have some suggestions that we use that we, we, we can develop in relation to doing that further down the road. But generally speaking, the, the reason that we would have had double member constituencies is so that we can increase the number of people that was available. In 1971, we took a decision to move to single member. And I think good on us because we establish a one-on-one -on -one relationship. And it also makes it easier to track and to, to analyze and so on. And, and most of my analysis of politics in Barbados um, started in 1971, because it was at that point that you could actually see uh, how many people a person represents. Um, the other significant development was the change in voting age from 21 to 18, and that happened in 1964. We spoke about that already. Um, the participation trends, are generally in um, a downward direction. Uh, and on the document that I prepared, you would notice that we moved from a situation where in 1951, we had a 65% level of participation. 1966 was the highest, we had an 80% level of participation. 1971, sorry, was the highest, we had an 82% level of participation. And then we moved to uh, 2022, where we have a 46 level percent level of participation. Now, I admit entirely that those numbers are exaggerated because a lot of those people can't vote. But regardless of whether that is the case or not, it is still clearly a downward trajectory. And I think that we have to ask ourselves, what is the, the reason for that? Um, if you look at the outstanding years in terms of voter participation, you had uh, 71, you had 86, you had 99, you had 2018, um, those are the, well, those were the higher, higher years. Uh, 2018 was the one of them, my apologies. So you had um, 66, 71, uh, in more recent times, 77. And then um, you, you're in the 60s, basically through 99, through 2018, and then you drop to 2022. Uh, my feeling is that 1986 represented a very high turnout simply because it was a point in time when people came out effectively to vote out the Barbados Labour Party. Uh, Prime Minister had died, uh, former Prime Minister had died, there was a level of dissatisfaction that was high and people came out to vote, vote the BLP out. Now we have had instances in which people came out to vote the DLP out, and I think that one of them comparatively would have been 1994. The problem in 1994, as I told you before, is that we had already cleaned the voters list. So our voter turnout may have been appearing to be um, uh, different kind of figure to what it was in reality, simply because 
the, the um, voters list was more clean in, in 1999, which would have been the other landslide year. The, the reality, however, is that the 86 landslide and the 99 landslides were two different conversations. The 99 landslide had a lot to do with voters withholding their support, while the 86 landslide was about voters coming out to vote. The other thing that is important, and this is moving away from the question of participation, is that by 1994, the Democratic Labour Party had been split, and there were persons who were perhaps willing to either withhold a vote for the DRP or vote against the DRP. Um, by, by 2003, 2008, then you know, there was, a, I would say, a vote of conversion, where a person became um, Bs. So the, the Arthur B uh, would have been around 1999. Uh, we have the Mia B around 2022. Um, those are the kinds of, of conversations and movements that we've been seeing. In 1986, though, it was a completely different situation where it was really all about the Democratic Labour Party, um, persons coming out who were DLP persons in larger numbers, and the DLP at that time had a larger base coming out to vote out the uh, persons from the Barbados, Barbados Labour Party that would have been at that time a particularly uh, unpopular organization. Uh, but as I said, that is moving in the direction of looking at trends, which I, I don't know, sorry, voting trends, which I think that we're more really about the uh, level of participation and the rate of participation has gone. Having said all of that, the, the question that comes up are what are some of the reform ideas that I may have? And uh, what are some of the other avenues for participation? And indeed, why have people not been voting or why does it appear that people are not been voting in ways that they would have before? So let's look at one which is obvious. In 1951, there was an excitement associated with the fact that we could vote based on age. And naturally, there was uh, an enthusiasm about participation because we had the opportunity to do so where before we did not have that opportunity. Clearly, now there is no longer any excitement. It's almost as though we got a new car, we drive the car, we are kind of bored with the car, and we figure, well, you know, we could as well um, do something else, which, which uh, we, we seem to be able to do. So one thing is that I do feel that there is no longer an excitement with being able to vote for the first time, and that's a, a consideration. The, the other thing which I think is interesting is that I think over time, we now have more things to do. And as a result of that, there is less excitement with voter participation as a way and means of being involved. So. In the 1950s, if I have an issue, probably the best way to get that issue resolved is to go to my representative, is to participate in voting, is to agitate and so on. Uh, and those are the ways that you deal with issues. So industrial action strikes, all of those things were a lot more popular and certainly voting was one of them. We now have other ways of getting involved. I, I run a call-in program, as you guys know, and um, you know people call the call-in program and they bring the issues to the call-in program. For many people, that's their election. They are interested in expressing their views and opinions in that regard. So if you are having an issue with um, getting electricity or getting water in an area, you call the call-in program and your issue is resolved. You may not feel it necessary to go to vote because as far as you're concerned, you've been able to get your, your issues dealt with in that regard. Now, the presumption is that if your issues are successfully dealt with in that forum, then you should go to vote for whoever dealt with the issue. The reality, however, is that a lot of people feel that it is the call-in program that deals with the issue. And since you can't vote for the call-in program, then they may not want to vote in one way or the other. So that's one factor. The other fact is that we have social media. The social media allows people to vent, express views and opinions in a way where they actually believe that they're empowering themselves a lot more than they actually are. And I do feel that social media is one of the bigger reasons why a lot of people are no longer interested in voting. When you think about it, you can write an article, you can publish it by clicking a button. You can um, publish a story and express this like. If someone puts up something that you're unhappy with, you can like it, you can love it, you can hug it or you can hate it. Compared to electoral support, if you want to express dislike for your representative, you have to make sure you're registered. You have to walk to a polling station or you can get a right, possibly. You have to stand in line in many instances for a long time uh, and then you have to cast your vote. 
The system is anachronistic. It is it's old. It, it's for many people more than they are prepared to do. And you know, when, when people tell me that on election day, I prefer to take a little bit more time to get to work than I would normally, and I could wash some clothes, uh, and that's what they prefer to do than vote. It is something which one, one understands is, is, a, is a reality. Um, and then you also have the media generally. The media is an opportunity and an avenue, the traditional media for people to express views and opinions. Uh, and as a result of that, many people may not feel as though there's a need to vote or to participate in elections in that way. The, the reality is that between 1951 and now, there are so many other ways you can express your views and opinions that you may very well feel that it is no longer necessary. Someone who is Jehovah Witness, for example, um, and there's a principle that they would not want to participate in um, elective politics, which is their right. Um, I tend to think a person like that in 1951 would have been less inclined to adhere to that principle than they are now, because currently most of the issues are being addressed without the need to, to vote. So as a result of that, they would, would um, they wouldn't, they, they would, they may very well not vote. Um, voting rights in the United States of America was a huge thing back in those days, because it was the basis on which people got rights to go to school and, and that type of thing. All of these issues have been dealt with in the context of Barbados. Many of them we never had in the first place. Uh, and for many people, their life is relatively good. So there's, there's really no need, or the feeling is that there's no need for them to vote or participate in any other ways. So how do you reverse this trend? And I, I, I have a, a relatively a list of considerations that I'm gonna give you to consider. I initially told the organizers that I would try to speak for 30 minutes and no more so that we can have the opportunity for conversation thereafter. Uh, and as I get close to that time, I'm gonna give you a couple of ideas that I wanted to throw in terms of reform. These are not necessarily recommendations, but um, issues that I think we ought to consider. And the, the, the important distinction for me is that this is not constitutional reform. And, and I think that there's a, a confusion, even, even among members of the government, where they believe that you can deal effectively with electoral reform in the context of constitutional reform. I, I beg to differ. Um, electoral reform is about the representation of the People's Act, where it needs to be reformed radically. Uh, and I would prefer that conversation to take place separate and apart from the conversation that we're currently having in relation to electoral, into to our constitutional reform. But as I said, I say that with the full knowledge that um, the government doesn't necessarily identify with my thinking in this regard. Um, but I have expressed views that I, I feel, you know, across the Caribbean, I think that we have been very, very tardy in terms of dealing with electoral reform issues. And we are currently in 2022, and we are driving horse and buggy as it relates to matters of voting and voting participation with um, representation of people acts that go all the way back to 1951. And this is exactly the same relationship that takes place all across the Caribbean. Cayman Islands is, is one of the few countries that actually has reformed their representation of the People Act significantly. And it's ironic because Cayman Island is a, it's an overseas territory. It's not even an independent country, but they've done more in that regard. So a couple of things we can think about. We need to make it possible for people to vote more easily. How do we do that? From the time you have a, uh, um, a situation where a person is registered, um, election is called, candidates are declared. So basically after nomination day, when you know who the candidates are, you have a whole period, I believe it's a week or two weeks between nomination day and voting. I think it's two weeks normally. Um, I, I speak subject to correction in terms of the number of days. There's absolutely no reason why more categories of people can't vote during that period. So currently there's special dispensation for poll workers for them to vote early. My feeling is that there needs to be, or there can be dispensation for other persons to vote during that period. That may make it more convenient. So persons who are elderly, there's no reason why they need to wait until, because you know who the candidates are. If they have made up their mind already, why can't they go and vote early? So the idea of only early voting, I think is something that needs to be considered. We need to have various methods of adapting voting to, to suit the needs of, of particular persons. So uh, a disabled person, 
has to make their way into the voting station to, to, to vote. Why can we not have a curbside situation where a person who is disabled can have a ballot brought out to them in some kind of a vehicle and they vote in that ballot? Alternatively, why can that person not vote from home via a mailing method where the, the ballot is posted to them and they post the ballot back? Now, I appreciate that there are security considerations in relation to all of these things and there are things that have to be worked through. But I feel that as we look to adapt our system, we need to move them in this direction. It was particularly egregious for me that during the course of this campaign, we had um, what could have been thousands of persons who were not participating in the election simply because they had COVID. And there was no facility to get those persons on the ballot, get their ballots in the, in the ballot box through other alternative mechanism. And we're talking about 2022, when as a country, we have done all other kinds of fascinating things. Uh, we can't, can't do it in that way. There's also a consideration about electronic voting. Um, it again has security considerations. Um, in the United States of America, they vote using voting machines, but the voting machines are voted are, are, are placed in the actual building and you have to make your way to those buildings. Um, that's something that I believe we could consider. Uh, we could also consider having electronic voting as, as is done in, in very limited instances in the US where um, you can vote through an electronic system. The problem, of course, is that then you have to be willing to declare to several people who you're voted for because it is not a private thing once it is on the internet, technically speaking. So um, in the interest of, of, of fraud prevention and so on, uh, that's something that would have to be done with the necessary uh, cautions in, in place. There was a proposal made by the Democratic Labour Party, and I have to confess that I am never really sure if these are DLP proposals or whether these are Ron Hayward proposals, but um, that's a, a matter perhaps to be pursued elsewhere, that we, we have overseas voting. Um, this has been a very, very controversial issue. Uh, I've also worked in another territory, St. Kitts and Nevis, where they have uh, adapted their system to allow persons to vote overseas. Um, I was part of that reform exercise and based on instructions that we received from not only the government, but from many of the voters, we came up with this system that allowed a person who is resident overseas to be domiciled in St. Kitts and Nevis, which means that this is a place that they plan to return today. Um, the domicile allowed you to be resident in Queens, but domicile in St. Kitts and Nevis, and you would vote based on your domicile when you came home. We have discovered, however, that that system is open to tremendous abuse because people have to come home and they change their domicile. And we had a situation in, in the election in 2015 where people were changing domiciles left, right and center to the point where <clears throat> you will be domiciled when you leave JFK and you change your domicile in the course of the plane. And then when you land, your domicile is something completely different. Um, and the irony is that your domicile often matched not where you had any intention today. <clears throat> it matched the place that the political party needed you your vote more because the voting situation was so narrow. As a result, this overseas voting has become very controversial. Uh, personally, I have never liked it because I believe in countries like the Caribbean, you have the potential to dwarf the number of people lo locally by the number of people overseas. Barbados is probably not as bad as St. Kitts and Nevis. St. Kitts and Nevis population is 40,000 and there are easily 100 and uh, probably um, three times as many Kittitians living overseas as there are at home. If you give all of these people the opportunity to vote, you create a situation where the decisions are made in terms of your government, a person who reside overseas, they get on a plane and they go back. The other factor is bringing them in is extremely expensive and the political parties ultimately have to fund it. So it becomes a situation where the party with a greater level of resources is the party that is able to triumph politically. So these are the considerations that we have to, to look at. I, I had a proposal, we heard a proposal from Ralph Gonzalez many years ago when this conversation was going on about St. Vincent and the Grenadines because they have a similar problem. And PM Gonzalez came up with the idea of having a diaspora constituency where persons vote within the diaspora in that constituency um, are for that person and that person alone. So if you had the DLP could say that Peter Wickham is their diaspora representative, um, 
that Ron Yearwood is a diaspora representative for the Barbados Labour Party, which cho chosen to, uh, let me say Justin, Justin Robinson, he's a diaspora representative for the Barbados Labour Party, Peter Wiggins is a diaspora representative for the Democratic Labour Party. We would campaign among the diaspora, make it easy for them to vote by mail-in ballots or however, and then they can vote. But their vote has to be for someone in that diaspora, because technically speaking, they don't live in, in, in one state, St. Michael, so they can't vote in one state, St. Michael. Uh, and that would be the kind of alternative that can be proposed. But Dr. Gonzalez's um, proposal hasn't really been taken anywhere, unfortunately. Uh, so that one is, is out for now, for now, but it is something that when we start to look at this issue, we can consider the diaspora seat as distinct from um, having other persons, uh, having a, a person just come and vote really nearly. Um, the mandatory voting is done in Australia. Uh, I don't like it personally. Uh, I think it is something that we need to uh, perhaps not consider. And um, the mandatory voting option is, is there, you know, basically saying to people you have to vote. What people do is they just uh, decide that they are going to um, just spoil the vote. That's a, a consideration that people can have if they want to. As far as list maintenance is concerned, As far as list maintenance is concerned, this is also an issue that we need to, to, to look at. When I say list maintenance, how do you maintain the voters list and keep it clean? And I think that any reform that we do ought to take that into consideration. Um, I have proposed uh, in other places, and it was, was, was slightly less, um, taken less seriously, but one of the things we can do is we can create a legislative instrument that forces people to identify their place of residence um, on a more regular basis than, than you know, whenever there's a re-registration. So if I, for example, and this is something that became controversial in St. Kitts and Nevis, because you can change your residence quite easily in, in, in Barbados, as is the case in St. Kitts. So when I moved to where I currently live, I changed my residence simply by um, signing a form. I didn't even sign the form. I gave the form to, to the, the representative and she took it in. Uh, and that's the way it is done in Barbados. So there's no check of verification that you've actually moved and so on. I like the idea of doing it somewhat differently where I receive a letter every year and I am legislatively required to respond to that letter and indicate that I am still living at the place where I was registered. And if that's not the case, where I am living now. That way, the electoral office has the capacity to monitor my movement, not only for purposes of um, voting, but also for purposes of um, you know, services, services that I may require as an individual. And it's a useful way. Now, people do have concerns about privacy and whatnot, but I, I say to you, in the United Kingdom, this is exactly what is there. Uh, and, and they don't have ID card systems. So why can we not do a similar thing where at the local level, people have to indicate where they live on an annual basis so that government knows that you are, if you've moved, then essentially you take your vote with you and, and it's not as wide uh, a thing as we are currently having. Um, another interesting idea is something that political parties can do. Currently, both political parties have youth arms. It's the League of Young Socialists, uh, the Young Democrats. Um, they are the two youth arms of the political parties. They also have women's movements. Mm -hmm. So there is the DLP Women's League and you have the Barbados Labour Party's Women's League, which at this current point in time seems to be doing extremely well in terms of being able to put a put um, uh, number of female candidates. So you have the Women's League and you have the Youth Arm. Based on the socialist model within Cuba, for example, there is a, a progressive women and progressive youth. Those are part of the conversation. I don't know that political parties have ever considered that this may be the beginning of it and that maybe you can have disabled um, groups within both the DLP and the BLP. So you can have disabled dens for Barbados and you can have disabled bees for Barbados. What about Christian organizations within political parties or even Muslim? You can have a caucus of Muslims within the Barbados Labour Party. And certainly there appears to be a large caucus of Muslims emerging within the BLP now. Um, there's no reason why you can't have on the other side, a caucus of Muslims emerging within the Democratic Labour Party. And the idea of a caucus doesn't necessarily mean that you are uh, under a party with you have to vote in a particular way, but it gives you the opportunity to embrace members of that community 
and vote in that direction. Of course, it is controversial to suggest that either political party could have an LGBTQ uh, organization within the midst. But I, I also believe that that's something that would work very well, where you ask people to organize around issues of sexuality, certainly within the United States of America. Uh, you have the, um, I think it's called log cabin uh, Republicans, who are essentially gay Republicans that, that agitate around those issues. Um, and it is a way to broaden the party base and to encourage participation and people who will contribute to help making policy more uh, youth friendly, women friendly, disabled friendly, Muslim friendly, Christian friendly, Baha'i friendly, or even gay friendly. Uh, and those are some things that we think that we ought to be able to, to consider. The proportional representation um, is also a consideration in many other regards. I don't like it, but I do feel that there's no reason why we should not look at having our upper chamber reflecting PR that gives new political entities the opportunity that can get a vote, that can get a, a seat, but can possibly gain some ascendancy into that um, upper chamber. And that's something that we can think about. Last two, um, Commonwealth persons in Barbados, persons who are members of the Commonwealth can vote if they've lived here for long enough. I, I, I do feel that we should limit it to CARICOM members. And I think that we should actively encourage CARICOM members who've lived in Barbados for more than three months to be able to vote in Barbados. Uh, the reality is that there are so many persons from the CARICOM region that now live in Barbados I think one good way of getting them fully involved in our system is by allowing and encouraging them to vote. If we fought a pitch battle last time to get those persons on the list from the Commonwealth basis, uh, I think that when we look at reform, we should look at bringing them into CARICOM. And then the final point is the age of participation. Um, in Barbados, you can drive at 16, you can vote at 18, um, you have to be 21 to be a, a member of parliament. Um, there's currently a proposal on the table, which I absolutely love to be able to become a member of parliament at 18. I see nothing wrong with that and I hope it works. Um, maybe there is a case to be made for reducing the voter participation age to 16, or maybe not. It's not something I'm necessarily um, supporting, but I'm saying these are one of the ways and means of increasing, increasing the voter base. So when I started, I indicated to uh, the um, the Historical Society group that I was not going to speak for more than 30 minutes and I've spoken for just under an hour. Uh, so I think this would be a useful point at which I could um, stop and ask if there are any questions or any other issues that we can address because I was really, um, I got carried away. So Professor, my apologies. Um, I, I am no longer fortunate like yourself to be able to teach at the university and I have to admit from time to time I miss this type of thing. So I, I often get carried away when I'm given the opportunity. Thank well, you. I, you know, as I often tell the students that when they give them an assignment and there's a word limit, if they go over the word limit, it has to be good. So you, so you went over your time limit, but it was good. So, 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 so you're okay. So I, I want to thank, thank you. you sir. <laughs> I want to thank you for that comprehensive and expansive presentation. Quite easy to follow. I think a lot of food for thought. So we have an audience on Zoom and on Facebook. And if you have a question that you want to raise with Peter, you can type your question in the Q&A and I would verbalize it and you would have a response from Peter. If you are on Facebook, you can type your comment or your question in the comment section. So who's gonna go first? Don't let me have to play tutorial leader and call anybody else. <laughs> audience i have um i actually have one question that came from um khalil coffee well another question more clarification right. and he's suggesting that matters of electoral reform are likely to be handled by the parliamentary reform commission and not the constitutional reform commission and he's a member of the latter so um it's entirely possible that reform will be done by the parliamentary reform commission um, I, I note it and I thank you for making that clarification. I, I still, however, would love to see a um, electoral reform commission set up, uh, even with a sole commissioner that calls on persons, uh, just to deal with issues of electoral reform and not necessarily parliamentary management, but that's just my bias. Okay, so Peter, I, I wanna, uh, maybe I can ask one question of using the chair. You. You started with the appeal of personality within the politics. 
Do you see our politics as being driven primarily by the personality of the leader of the party as, as opposed to a political party that has some philosophical foundation? Yeah, no, I think I think it has it's down to personality now in large measure. Um, right. I think the Arabara personality, um, the Oenata personality, and, and certainly now the Prime Minister Mali personality has taken it completely off the charts. So I, I think it's really about personality. Um, I struggle not only in Barbados, but across the Caribbean, I struggle to identify the philosophical difference between political parties in relation to things like the International Monetary Fund. Um, Grenada has had a massive change from the uh, NNP to the NDC. It wasn't a massive swing, but a massive change. Um, both parties are philosophically committed to the Citizenship by Investment Program. They just would approach it differently. And I find that that's fascinating. Same thing in Antigua and Barbuda. So yeah, it's, it's really a personality thing. And I, and I think that that's um, not a, not a bad basis on which to vote, uh, because guess what? United States of America and United Kingdom, you know, it's pretty much about, about personalities as well. Uh, Boris Johnson, sorry, uh, Tony Blair. Tony Blair invented this concept of new labor. <laughs> and essentially new labor, I mean, you're an economist uh, in another life, and you know that new labor is essentially just a nicer way of saying, we're technically speaking conservative, but just conservative <laughs> with, a, with a slightly more socialist face um, than that was the case. And then you have social political, conservative political parties implementing or adhering to, to, to things like death benefits and whatnot, which is kind of more socialist. So I do feel that we have evolved into the personality era. Okay, I see. I see Devaran has a hand up. Devaran Bruce. Hey, Justin, thank you for that. And hey, Peter, I, I must say, I thought it was quite difficult for me to <laughs> disagree with what you have said thus far. Um, one area I thought that was missing, though, you spoke towards the fact of obviously electoral turnout and the reasons why people don't vote. What I thought was key as well was the fact that you have the political party at the center of the electoral process and really getting the vote out. And one of the things I think we've discussed before was really not the reason why people don't vote, but the reason why they do. And one of those reasons really is the cash on hand that political parties have on election day, what we call vote buying. And really, one, how do you address issues of vote buying, but largely what level of transparency is necessary when it comes to the cash on hand that political parties have? Where is this money coming from? Um, what allegiances are made to get this money? What, what does it mean going forward for governance? So we thought those were the two areas that could probably, probably possibly be discussed the financial aspect regarding vote buying and the financial aspect for political parties in general regarding getting the vote out. Yeah, um, Devron has stepped into a very interesting realm because um, I'm often asked about vote buying, but to the best of my knowledge, it doesn't happen. I didn't really lose <laughs> vote buying in Barbados. Um, is the elephant in the room. And you are, you're very correct that it is a, it's a factor. And, and I feel that there may be a possibility in the future that we can have a conversation about um, electoral participation in, in terms of voter turnout and, and, and issues in relation to that um, as a separate thing, because it's a, it's a fulsome kind of conversation that we need to have. Um, I do acknowledge that a lot of people vote because they get money. Uh, a lot of people uh, organize and lobby on election day and you'll have a, a team leader with you know, 50 ID cards and he says to somebody, you know, I could deliver these to you. Um, I want X amount of money. In some instances it works. Um, I, I must tell you that I live in a constituency where I have never, I have tried very hard to be in a position where someone can offer me money for my vote, but I have always been unsuccessful. That I have never seen it and no one has ever come to me and, and asked me uh, for a vote. The um, price is too high, Peter. <laughs> maybe, maybe the price yeah, is too well. high. I, I should also point out that um, I live in Prime Minister Molly's constituency, and the reality is that she, she wins it by either 60 or 80, 70 or 80 percent of the total popular vote. The, the likelihood that someone else can win down here is so low that, um, and, and Prime Minister Molly is not one for, for, for paying for votes that um, maybe if I want to benefit, I need to move to a slightly more marginal area where 
and maybe able to negotiate a, a thing. But um, you know, I'm being serious. Um, the, 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 the probably the best way to get away from bulk buying is to increase the number of persons available to a particular candidate. And I, I have done elections in the British Virgin Islands. Ironically, it's in the news now. But in the BVI, they have something called a large constituent, a large representatives. Um, and what you do with a large representative is that they represent the entire country and not just a particular area because so the, the, the number of electors available for um, the British Virgin Islands, in some instances, you have people that are essentially representing 500 people because you have so many, so many electors and so little in terms of your population size. And you need to have 30 people in a parliament or 20 people in a parliament to make it work. But if you put 30 people and you divide it by the population, you're coming up with a number that is, is minute. And if you have 300 people electing one person, then there's always a temptation on the part of that person to essentially buy 300 votes. And 300 votes are not hard to buy. Vote buying is less popular in places like Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica, because you're, you're dealing with thousands and thousands of people and you can't really buy them out as easily. It happens in Barbados in marginal constituencies because 200 votes will make a difference, 300 votes will make a difference. In Caracol and Petit Martinique, um, money enough must be spent on during the election because the difference in terms of win or loss is seven votes, and that's always the case. So my solution to vote buying is let's go the direction where we have our reform of having another layer where we have representatives at large. So if you stick in, uh, let's say, 10 national representatives, it's impossible to buy them. So you would have a balance between the constituency representatives that people could buy if they want to, or, but then you also have the national representatives that it's hard to buy 350,000, um, 250,000 uh, people. And as a result, you don't really have it at the national level. So my, my solution would be a balance between the two. Um, having national representatives, uh, with what the BB Islanders call at large representatives, I mean, I said it on the radio before. Uh, and then I think it would take the sting out of the extent to which these localized representatives their, their, their two and 300 votes would be, would be effective in terms of, of stealing a government or taking a government. Yes, and let's hope that over time, people will be less interested in, in, in buying. Sorry. Related sorry, to Desmond. that, Peter, as, as a question came in from Facebook, mm -hmm. with such a relatively small population, why do we need so many politicians? Well, I mean, you know, some time ago, Dr. Bell answered that point and he said, we should have as many po po politicians as we could afford. Um, if, if you look at a place like Nevis, Nevis has local government and the local government in Nevis is, is um, uh, four, four constituencies, the population is 10,000 and they, they have a ridiculously small number of people in parliament. The, the solution might be to reduce the number, but the problem is that our electoral, our political system does not work well with small numbers. Right. I mean, we have already seen problems occurred in, in places like Grenada where you have this 15-15 and whatnot, you know, back and forth. Um, and some of the other islands are similar. You need to have a critical mass that is not necessarily 600 that the UK has but something closer. So I would say for purposes of efficacy, we need to have a parliament that's probably between 30 and 50 people, regardless of the population size. Right. And the question is really if you can afford to pay them. And you know, as Dr. Bell said, if you have the money to pay them, why not? These politicians are not paid that much money anyhow as representatives. So there's no reason why we can't have more of them because if you look at the senators, the senators are paid next to nothing. So there's no reason why instead of having 21 of them where we can not have um, you know, 50. I have some representing, you know, at the national level or representing parties at that level, because as I said, they're not really paid any big set of money anymore. Yeah, I see a hand from K Hall. Okay. Good afternoon, Peter. Actually coming back to, to your answer to the question prior to the one that, that you just answered, where you were suggesting that there was a candidate at large as well as the local electoral candidates. That sounds rather similar to me to the system which is being practiced in the United States, which does not look from the outside like if it's working very effectively at this point in time. Would you care to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, elect the, but the Americans have two layers. They have the Senate layer and they have the representative layer. Uh, and then you also have the layer for president. So they, they have different layers of representation. 
Um, in France, the situation is the same. You, you elect a president and then you also elect a parliament and, and there are prime ministers chosen from the parliament currently. They, they have either two or three. Um, I think President Macron was trying to identify another one. Um, and then you also have local representatives. I, I, I am actually open to the idea of us trying it. And I, I don't believe that the American system isn't working. I think that it provides layers of opportunity for political aspirants. Um, and again, it just comes back to the question of, of whether or not people can afford it. Their, their system appears to work. I think it's been abused by one person, but the fact that you have you know, Congress able to, to work through the issues and deal with them in this way means that maybe the system is working far better than, than it appears to. The, the other question, Kay, which is relevant is whether we need to have a system in Barbados, whether our system isn't working as well as it should. Um, one of the problems is vote buying. Uh, Devron mentioned that. But I think a far larger issue is the extent to which there are so many people who feel alienated because they're not part of the political process. The Rastafarians are clearly um, feeling alienated. Um, I, I, I am struggling to understand why they don't believe that they can do a presentation and be heard. Um, so maybe there are other opportunities and avenues that we have to create for representation at the parliamentary level that go beyond what we currently have, uh, which will be reflected in our system not working. I see one other question here online. Rather than making non-CARICOM Commonwealth citizens ineligible, so rather than making non-CARICOM Commonwealth citizens ineligible, why not make this reciprocal? Barbadian residents in the UK can vote there. So mm -hmm. under this suggestion, a UK citizen should be able to vote in Barbados on this basis. Yeah. No, as it stands now, the, uh, a UK citizen in Barbados, a Commonwealth citizen who lives in Barbados for long enough can. And that was right. the critical point that was made in the last election. I just don't know that they should. Um, oh, that's, my, uh, that's, yeah. what, that's what my colleague Ventos gave some trouble. There you go, right. He went to court and he got a declaration in that regard. Um, and I'm, I'm happy that he was able to participate. So it, it's just that I, I think the, the potential for abuse um, in St. Kitts and Nevis, there was a time that there were a lot of Africans coming to St. Kitts to study as medical students. Um, and, and naturally, because you come from Africa to study as a medical student, you would be in St. Kitts for a long time. So you would at least be there for four years. And many times, you know, it came across an election and, and they would have voted in that election. The, the fact of the matter is that the number um, and the volume became instructive in some instances because you, you can have like maybe 50 students and, and their margins in St. Kitts and Nevis were tiny. So sometimes the students were being encouraged to register in places where they didn't live because the vote was, was, was more useful. And then it becomes some level of economic value associated be, to being able to register as a voter. Um, the, the relative comparative size of Barbados versus India, United Kingdom and other places makes me a bit uncomfortable. And I just wonder whether we should keep the CARICOM thing because certainly a lot of my Guyanese brothers and sisters that come here, um, even if they come and spend six months and go back, you know, during an election, they can vote. Um, I, I, I wonder whether um, they, they, there's a need to probably peg it back a bit and go in the direction of this, come, come, just the, the CARICOM. But again, it's a question that we, we can throw out, you know, and, and that Barbados will have to decide what, which direction we want to go in. But I definitely feel we should maintain the option for persons, at least from the Caribbean region who are here. Uh, currently, as it exists, they can. And I think that that's a good thing. Uh, I just wonder whether we want to limit it. Um, Michael, Michael asked a question online. I don't know if I can insert that here. Yeah, yeah, um, go ahead. And he was saying about an odd number of constituencies and suggesting that we move from 30 to 31 and that we have a St. Philip East. Michael is a St. Philip resident. He, he is from the Republic. Uh, so he has a special reason why. Um, St. Philip is the fastest growing constituency, fastest growing parish in terms of numbers. Uh, and I think there's every justification for a third, a fourth constituency in St. Philip because it really is the only constituency that has the numbers that can justify it. So um, I would say I support it. Um, invariably, St. Philip has a DLP bias. And when we have done changes, we have always tried to bring balance to those changes. So if you create a DLP constituency, then you also create 
a BLP constituency to give ballots. Um, in the past works, we created one on one, and then some time ago we created one and gave it away. But you know, you, you, we, we need to, to have balance. The problem is that if we bring balance, we are um, likely to bring balance that will get us back to the 30-30. And I agree that we should have an odd number because otherwise you may have a Trinidad and Tobago situation. We have a question here from Khalil Kotwala. Peter, where do you come down in the debate between unicameralism and bicameralism here in Barbados? Yeah, it's easy. I'm a, I'm a bicameral baby because we've always had two chambers and I like, I like the idea of a second chamber uh, however, I don't believe that the second chamber should be currently configured in the way it is, but this is moving outside of the mandate that I've been given today to speak to, you know, representation of politics and stuff. Right. Um, I, I, I am struggling to understand who these seven people that the uh, governor general or the president is, is, is identifying, who do they represent? Because they don't represent me. Um, perhaps they represent her. But this idea that the president has this intrinsic ability to identify independent interests is something that I struggle with. And I think that this last fiasco that we had where our president was able to choose not, not just the, the few five, but seven candidates that are persons that were independent was, 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 was taking it to an even more ridiculous level because it, it's no step in where you know, presumably she's exercising power that is political. Now, the, Preferred option was thrown out by the Democratic Labour Party, others who voted against it. Uh, and then it was a situation where it was put back in her lap to identify these people and she's identified persons. I, I don't have a problem with the individuals that she's identified on a personal level. I mean, um, Dr. Hines and, and um, I, you know, Dr. Bathurst, I think are, are, are perfectly evident, eminently qualified to do what they're doing. I just have a problem with the idea of the way that our bicameral chamber is configured. I feel that when we vote, the party should perhaps be given a quota based on the level of support that they have, and that should be represented in the upper chamber. Um, it's interesting that the same Dr. Hines, Christina Hines, has herself agreed that this is the preferred way to do it. And let's get away from this idea of selection of parties to represent. You know, if the church is interested in having a representative in parliament, then the church can run someone. I, I don't think that we need to be in a situation where we're guaranteeing the business sector, guaranteeing the church, guaranteeing the trade union. No, let's have a situation where you vote, and if the DLP gets 40% of the vote, they get 40% of the space in, in Senate. And that's how I believe we should fill out our um, upper chamber. Uh, and certainly I would like it to be larger than the 21. As I said, I think we can probably go to a bigger chamber. The, the nice mahogany table that you guys sit at would have to be um, either expanded or we have to get a new table, but um, <laughs> by and large, I think it would be great to, to have it expanded. Okay, so I think we've had, yeah. Kay, you wanna come back in? Uh, yes, I see Kay coming back in. Um, I do have one more question. Um, a, a couple of years back, we had had the introduction of constituency councils. Mm -hmm. And I think I and a lot of other Barbadians struggled with how they were supposed to function within the existing political structure. And you don't really hear very much about them nowadays, but they came back to mind when you started talking about the different layers of representation. Do you think that there is a place really for the councils if they're implemented in, in where they can be implemented in an efficient manner to be a part of a layered system like what you're conceptualizing. That's mm -hmm. question number one. Mm -hmm. And question number two comes back to what you were just talking about. I thought about it when you were when you were talking just now, where you were saying, well, you think that if you if you get 40% of the votes, then you get 40% mm -hmm. of the representation. And therefore the, the governor general does not need to arbitrarily pick people from different parts of society. But what happens then? where we get these two clean sweeps and there really is no opposition? Or is the opposition mm -hmm. going to come back then to, like you say, the call-in programs and social media and so on? So those are my two last minute questions. Um, the, the second one is, is, is quite easy because my, my proposal is that our allocation of Senate space is based on party support. The Democratic Labour Party got about 30 something percent support in the last election. I remember the exact figure. Um, so technically speaking, they could get 30 something percent of the seats. If you don't win a seat in parliament, doesn't mean that you can't have space in the Senate because if the Senate's allocation is 
30% of the 21 seats, you would have some representation there. And I think if you give the Senate an expanded role, it, it would act as a nice balance and a counter to this whole situation of having a clean sweep. The, the other thing is that if you move towards having national representatives, as I, as I propose, the, the at-large system, then you also create a buffer because it's unlikely that a party is going to sweep the national representatives and the local representatives. It can happen, but it's less likely. And it gives you um, some kind of a balance. Uh, the constituency councils were well-intentioned. Um, you know, it was the brainchild of, of my good friend, Chris Sinclair. Well, I should say our good friend, Chris Sinclair, because he's also a good friend of, of Professor Robinson. This is one of Barbados's best kept secrets that Professor Robinson and, and our former Minister of Finance, Chris Sinclair, were close friends at the university <laughs> when, they were all, when we were all studying together. Um, but yeah, he, he, it was well intentioned and his idea was to create an additional layer. The problem was that once the minister chooses these people, you have problems because it asks to the minister. And that's exactly what happened as minister of social transformation. He chose constituency um, councils for everyone, all 30. And you know these people ultimately were answerable to the minister because they're appointed by the minister. I think they were appointed by the governor general on the advice of the minister. Uh, and unless you can have a direct way of choosing them and making these persons answerable to someone other than the minister, it, it was a, a waste of time. And I think it was well-intentioned, but as it fell and it became a, a system where the minister appointed everyone, um, he sought recommendations. And on the base of recommendations he made his, his, his selection. The problem is that he had no obligation to do that, but it was good that when he did it, when Chris did it, he actually did um, find out who people wanted and he made sure that the councils had people who were dems and bees and disabled and you know elders and whatnot. It was, it was well uh, thought out. The problem is that the potential for abuse was, was, was quite great. Okay, okay, thanks for that. So I think we've had a full discussion, Peter. So what is left for me to do is on behalf of the Museum of Historical Society to really thank you for taking your time to really share with us with what has really been a comprehensive and an expansive discussion on the governance of the country, electoral politics, which is quite critical. So again, thank you very much. I wanna thank the audience and I look forward to you joining us for our next lecture. Who's that gonna be, Kay? Who's up next? We're going to be having uh, Professor Hilary Beckles um, next week. And Professor Beckles, let me do my notes very quickly. You kind of caught me off guard. Um, give you the, the, the name of that lecture. Well, you know, I, I, I have to put in a plug for my boss. I, I, I will get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually don't have the laptop where I have it open up. So I'm actually trying to pull it very quickly from my email. <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed here, but we're def it's definitely Professor Beckles. And he's more or less going to be talking about the different nationalist movements. I can't remember the, the precise name of the lecture topic, but he's going to be talking about the different national movements that have brought us towards not just independence, but on towards the, elect, um, Republic. Uh, the Republic. So things like the Black Horror Movement and, and the different types of movements that you would have had throughout the, 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 the political process of Barbados leading up to independence and beyond and taking us gradually towards the Republic. Okay, so, 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 so I think the title, the, the title Road to the Republic, Exploring 400 Years of a Political Experiment. That's the, that's the title of the entire series. Ah, okay. So okay. that's our overall theme. Okay, so again, thank you. And we look forward to you joining us next week when we have... Okay. The Honorable Sir Professor Hilary Beckles. Thank, Thank you and take care. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Take care. Bye -bye.